We live in a fast-paced world where everyone must stay relevant and be nimble in responding to changes around us. For workers, it may mean picking up new skills at every stage of their careers to secure good jobs, good pay and good career progressions. For companies, it may be a case of survival as they face rising business costs and labour curbs. So how can Singaporean workers and local businesses better prepare for future jobs? And what will happen to Singapore's manpower landscape? Minister, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today to talk about the manpower situation and jobs of the future. Now, recently, the Manpower Ministry shared that in 2015, local employment grew by only 100 jobs. That's the lowest in 17 years. It's actually very worrying. Are Singaporeans running out of jobs? Tell us what the future of the employment landscape will look like. There are actually two sides to employment. One is the supply meaning the number of workers available to take on jobs. And two, the demand side is in terms of the number of jobs available. If you look at the Singaporean workforce, over the last 10 years, it had been growing. On the average, about 70,000 a year. Some years more, some less. But last year, it dropped to almost zero. So the question is why? One of the main factor is that over the next 10-15 years, we're going to see a larger number of Singaporeans every year retiring from the workforce. That's one aspect. Second aspect is our low birth rate it has stopped in high since 18-20 years ago. Then on top of that, the employment rates of Singaporeans are already very high. About 80% of Singaporeans aged between 25 to 64 are already working for us to try to increase that percentage in the future will become harder and harder. So we put all these factors together, plus the growing uncertainty in the economic outlook. Singaporean workers will be harder and harder to come by, not just in the short term, but in the medium to long term. The employment landscape that we are going through the next five years and beyond will be very different from the last five years. In the future, we'll be looking at maybe 1% to 2% growth in the workforce. And I would say that this will have tremendous implications. The increase sounds very low, right? So if this is the start of some kind of trend, it is very much of concern. My main concerns are tightening of the labour market and companies restructuring to adjust to this new employment landscape. What we cannot have in quantity, we have to make up through quality. So in other words, we cannot go back to creating 100,000 jobs every year we have to make sure that the jobs are of better quality and the upgrading of the workforce must be kept in sync to ensure that there's no mismatch of jobs and skills, what we call structural unemployment. Well, we have some employers from different industries here with us today, even the trade union. So what are your views about the future employment landscape and how do you think we can better adapt to it? I'm concerned about what I call the three mismatches. Firstly, is the skills mismatch. Second, the jobs mismatch. And third, actually, is the expectation mismatch. How we can minimise these mismatches will be one of the challenges, not just from a worker perspective, but also in terms of employers. If we're going to have a larger workforce made up of professionals, managers, and executives. Now it's one third. And if we include the technicians, PMETs is about half, and it's growing exponentially. The other group that is growing quite rapidly is the ageing workforce. Therefore, these are challenges which we need to tackle as a country. And it's not just workers alone have to bite the bullet, but I think employers as well as society must have greater acceptance that we're going to have an ageing workforce and that it's going to happen. But how do you see us being able to adapt better in the future? What do you tell the workers? Sustainability is a very, very important concept because sustainability will include how you can keep and retain members of your staff and your workforce. The landscape will not give you workforce just because you're out there and have a job available. Your success is also going to be dependent on how you can get collaborative synergy from your employee. You can have just an employee or have a very, very committed employee with deep skills. 
at the employee end, that sense of a greater responsibility, that sense of being a part of that company, developing their deep skills within that job, and constantly look at how they themselves can add more value to the company. That collaborative synergy is going to be really, really important. For the construction industry, we're talking about bigger projects. The level of mechanization in terms of products, pre-casting, volumetric construction, it has gone that direction. But yet, there are very, very few Singaporeans who are willing to pick up a hammer and nail into a piece of timber. So, I think we have to look at it at a sectorial level and also at the maturity of each industry. And then you have the service industry, the F&B, of which I used to be involved in. And there's another big industry where there's a lot of staff movement. A lot of Singaporeans can't keep the long hours. It's not that we are no good, it's just the very nature that we are in that comfort zone and jobs are tight and we can always find a job anytime we want. We are putting a lot of effort to redesign the job make it a bit more sexy in the sense that it is really a career and not just a job. We're putting a lot of things in place. Talking about making jobs sexy, I've, something came into my mind was about the culinary industry. Actually, we did a good U-turn around. When it first started, nobody wanted to work in the kitchen because it's hot, it's tired. You're working at night on holidays, right? But now, because of this master chef and Gordon Ramsay, the chef's profiles have become a lot more sexy and exciting. We actually now don't really have a problem getting culinary staff, so that has been a good solution. From the employer's standpoint, I guess we just have to live with the fact that it will be difficult to get Singaporeans. And what we have to do is be better employers. That means that we have to invest in training and make us an employer of choice. So that's the reality of the situation. What we observe is that there are two types of employers. One type are what we call the hunter type. All they want is basically consume human resource. They'll go to the labour market, they'll just target the people they need, pay high wages if necessary to bring them in, and they make use of their expertise, resources. Then at some point in time, hello, goodbye, you serve my purpose and it's done. Then there's another type, which is what we call the farmer type. You take in the people, you train them, you nurture them, you give them a proper career path. As we move into this new employment landscape, we need more and more to hopefully adopt less of a hunter mindset, more of a farmer mindset, so that we can truly look at human resource, not as a resource for consumption, but rather a resource for investment and turn them into capital for your company and for the economy. I think, therefore, the most important thing that a company has to do is to recognize that one of the key drivers of growth, the competitive advantage, is the people that work for you. And it is the capabilities that make a difference. Not just believe in growing business, but growing people. Making sure that people remain relevant. If you take athletes, for example, they spend 90% of the time training and 10% of the time performing. So we have to balance training and work. The second bit is the environment that you create in terms of workplace the aspirations of our people are changing. And I think we have to recognize that. People don't believe in hierarchical systems. The old concept of workplaces where bosses lock themselves up in a room while others are working outside. How do you create what I call the democratization of workplaces, where you respect everyone's roles and responsibilities rather than you respect people's titles? And those are some of the things that I think have to change and I like the way you put it, your very important point is that you are growing the people as well. So the construction sector must continue to grow in a manpower lean way. In the hotel sector, the number of new hotel rooms will increase by 20%. Over the next five years, I was very encouraged that the industry came together. They've decided to grow the hotel sector in a manpower lean way. Minister, amidst uncertainties, many fellow Singaporeans are genuinely concerned particularly two groups, the younger ones who are going to enter the workforce in the next couple of years. And also the mature ones, because we are starting to see quite a few layoffs in various sectors. And with your figures coming out that job growth is just mere 100, what's the landscape like for these Singaporeans who are going to come out and look for jobs? We pay very special attention to the unemployment rate of our local workers. If the jobs have gone to the foreigner, what it means is that more Singapore will become unemployed, unemployment will have gone up. 
but that did not happen in 2015. Unemployment is still low. What we saw in 2015 is very different from what we saw during the downturn in 2009. During the global financial crisis in 2009, local employment dropped and unemployment went up because we did not have enough jobs in the market. But in 2015, local employment slowed down, but unemployment stayed low. So what it means is that the bottleneck is not the shortage of jobs, but the shortage of the workers. Just because at this moment, the overall employment situation is still healthy, we should not take the future for granted. Young Singaporean workers, they have a better skill, better education profile. Therefore, their aspiration is higher. Their expectation is also higher as well. So we have to make sure we enhance the quality of jobs, that they are given fair and equal opportunities to access those jobs, so that at the end of the day, the Singaporean core grow stronger by the day. Minister, you make a very good point about competitiveness and productivity. As long as both the government and the industry can work together to ensure the levels of capabilities and skills of the workforce, the Singaporean workforce is actually providing the best and the most competitive offerings. And that is really how you can actually make it sustainable longer term. So if I were to use a very simple formula to describe what happened in the last four years, is that we've been growing as an economy at the four plus zero GDP, equal to four. Looking ahead, the workforce can no longer grow at 4%. As I mentioned earlier, our local workforce growth is coming down. At the same time, we are moderating the increase of a foreign workforce in Singapore. We put the two together. The total workforce growth will slow down from 4% in the last four years towards 1%. Now, so if we continue to slow down the total workforce growth, we are not able to improve our productivity. We are going to enter into a stage whereby the future growth will be defined by one, plus zero, so 1% growth in the workforce plus a 0% increase in productivity give us only about 1% growth in our GDP. If we do not increase our productivity, eventually we could be heading for economic stagnation. And once we hit by economic stagnation, there will be unemployment. The aim is to strive for one plus two. So in other words, upgrade the productivity from 0% in the last four years towards a 2%. I think that's a good outcome for us if we were to succeed in our restructuring. On the one hand, slow down the workforce growth, at the same time, improve our productivity gain so that our economy can continue to grow in a healthy and sustainable manner.